Thank you, thank you. We have a, an all-star panel here today. Very excited, I, I work, work with some of them on panels and speaking engagements before, and um, particularly excited to have all three of them here. They all have different expertise, and we're gonna tap into some of those things, but while we have a couple of them up here, we're gonna start uh, and have Roger give us a little bit of an explanation between EB-5s and E-2s, a little bit about what the difference between those are. Try it again. Test, test. See? All right. There you go. We're in business. Well, thank you for inviting me here. Sure. So what I'd like to do is just give you a background between the two different types of visas. The E-2 visa is a non-immigrant visa. It's given for a temporary period of time. It is uh, controlled by the State Department rather than the USCIS, which means that you apply directly at a US consulate abroad. There are uh, treaties between the US and different countries and treaties of investment. And in order to qualify for the E2 investment treaty, uh, you have to be a national of the treaty that has, is a party to the, with the United States. So um, you're restricted. There's many countries that don't qualify. Uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China are the major BRIC countries that don't qualify. And um, in Miami, most prevalently, you see a lot of uh, Argentinians, Colombians, uh, that, and Europeans that can be, afford that E-2 visa. The, um, the, the theory behind the E-2 visa is to bring substantial investment into the United States and to, uh, to spur the economy. So uh, there's no set minimum amount. Uh, they want to see a substantial investment. Um, the investment must be active and real and you must show the source of the money where the investment came from. The, um, the benefit of the E-2 visa is it's five years, it can be continued. There's, um, for, from tax purposes, you're not necessarily taxed as, as a U.S. resident, depending on the amount of time you spend in the United States. Uh, it's excellent for children and spouses because you get a, a work permit and uh, travel authorization. So the E-2 is uh, a very favored visa. It's the, the Rolls-Royce of, of non-immigrant visas for the ease of application and the uh, extension of time almost indefinitely so long as you maintain the in investment. The EB-5 visa, in contrast, is a permanent visa. It's an immigrant visa. It, it leads to your green card. The, uh, there are two programs in EB-5. There's the direct EB-5 program where you it, it can invest either $500 or $1 million dollars so long as you, your, your investment creates 10 jobs. And then there's the regional center program, which um, allows for indirect job creation. The, uh, the, EB, the central purpose of the EB-5 program is to, to also create jobs and also to uh, have direct and foreign, direct foreign investment into the United States. Uh, unlike the E-2 visa, there is, there's a, um, there's a definitive amount of uh, a capital investment, either 500,000 or a million dollars. The 500,000 threshold is, mi is met. Uh, if you invest in a high unemployment area, which is uh, defined as 150% above the national unemployment rate, or a rural area, which is uh, generally populations less than $20,000. So if you meet those thresholds, the investment amount is 500,000 for the EB-5, for the E-2, in contrast, there is no set investment amount. For the E-2, the government wants to see uh, that the investment is uh, substantial enough to, to meet the investment objectives. The, the EB-5 program requires that you create 10 jobs. If it's a direct investment, it's, uh, it's 10 direct jobs. If it's a regional center investment, it's direct, indirect, or induced jobs. The, uh, for E-2 visa, this, there's no requirement, there's no set requirement about how many jobs are created, but they, the government does want to see that the enterprise will lead to more uh, employment. From, from a tax perspective, the, the EB-5 uh, will, um, will kick in to uh, make, you, make you subject to U.S. income uh, and residency tax. Let, let, let me bring this to, to Ronnie. We had talked about this a little bit before in the past. 
the EB-5, sometimes one of the pitfalls is it can take longer and sometimes the, e, uh, the E-2 is a better solution, but can you talk a little bit about the, the length of time? Yeah, so e EB-5 uh, is, is a victim of a, can you hear me okay, everybody? Yeah. Hang on. I'll try to speak up. I don't know if the technology's working here, but it's, there you go. we'll work it out. I'll call some of the Chinese technicians to come in here. here. Um, e EB-5 um, has really a victim of its own success. Uh, there's a 10,000, as Roger mentioned, there's a 10,000 visa cap, meaning that a visa is, just so everybody understands, when you apply for an EB-5 petition, um, it's not me. Okay. apply for an EB-5 petition, that petition includes the applicant, the spouse, and any children under the age of 21 at the time the petition has been filed. So an, a one petition could be for multiple people, uh, just as a matter of notation, Last year and the year before, China's a dominant uh, player in EB-5. They represent 80 to 85% of EB-5 capital. And in China, as we know, there generally are two or three applicants. It's one child, and it may be one, uh, one of the parents. A lot of times, both parents don't apply for tax reasons. So the, the average, so 10,000 visas probably gets you about 3,500 petitions a year. So it's a very limited program, unfortunately. And what happened in 14, 15, and 16 is the program exploded because of real estate. It's really, it's really a real estate-based lending program. And what happened was $4.3 billion was invested last year in EB-5. Now, if you do the math, that's far more than 10,000 visas. And the answer is, you betcha, it's about 30,000 visas. So what's happening is, and part of the problem we're facing, is that because of what's called retrogression under the, uh, under the statute, the, the governing statute, once a country once the system meets a cap, they look at each country, and any country 7% or more of EB-5 petitions starts retrogressing, meaning they're holding up their visas because they're dominating the marketplace. Well, China is 80, 85%. So obviously, there is no other, there is no number two in the world. Number two in the world is one or 2%, like uh, Vietnam, South Korea, India, maybe Brazil, Mexico. They're all Venezuela. They're all like 1%. China is 80, 85%. So you realize when we're talking about China in the prior panel, EB-5 is substantially China-centric today, but changing over time. So the problem you have is if you're dealing with Chinese nationals, because of retrogression, you're now waiting. If you, right now, the visa has been opened up. In other words, when you apply for a, a visa, you file a 526 application, you get approved. That means your application's been approved, we accept you. Now you wait for your visa appointment. In the olden days, I have my two immigration experts here, that would be, what, four to six months typically to get a visa appointment anywhere in the world. It's a four to six month process, right, give or take? If you're outside the United States. If you're outside the United States. If you're inside the United States, it's another process I'll tell you about. So the whole process said, okay, I apply, I get my approval, it takes me a year and a half to get my 526 approval. I wait up to six months to get my immigration status, I get my visa, I move to the United States, I've now got my green card, temporary green card. I stay here two years, and I file for my E29 and give me, make myself a permanent resident. And by the way, that when I, when I get my temporary green card, that counts towards the five years towards citizenship. And the whole family gets included. What's happened in China is because of retrogression, they're now at uh, March of 2014, meaning if you haven't filed your, if you filed your 526 petition before March of 2014, you're gonna get your visa appointment. Anybody filing later, is waiting to get waiting in line. As of today, the prediction is there are 20,000 petitions pending. I understand from in the system, 20,000. There's about a five to seven year wait in China today to get a visa appointment. What does that mean? I file my petition. I don't get my even. I'm not even on the queue line to get a visa appointment until I get my 526 approval. I get my 526 approval based upon the current standards. This whole process could take me easily six, seven, eight, not eight years, give or take, to even get my visa for me to enter the United States. So you can realize this whole EB-5 process could be a 10-year process to get your... We're, we're going to come back and talk a little bit about the legislative issue and if, uh, where you see that going, if they're going to expand but, but, that. But, but I want to emphasize, mm -hmm. I will, but I want to emphasize, this is only China. Right. So <laughs> let's understand, the rest of the world is fine. So what we're seeing is much more emphasis on LATAM, Middle East, some Europe, but Latin America is becoming a major player in EB-5, mm -hmm. being in Miami. Right. Obviously, this is a great market for EB-5 because it's Lat Latams have second homes here. They come here, they visit here, they have direct flights, they invest in real estate here. So they're a logical investor. 
and especially Florida generated EB-5 programs, and we're, we're all here actively involved in the industry, and Latin America is becoming a more in, influential part of the and, segment. And that's where I want to bring Glenn in here, because you have experience uh, with Canada, with Latin America, and with Europe. And so to this point, which, which brings me to the point, what, what trends are you seeing? Are you seeing certain co uh, countries start to step up with the E2 and the EB-5? Are you seeing any shifts? What are you seeing in, 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 uh, from your perspective? Well, when it comes to Canada and Europe, you get a lot of E2 treaty investor visa applications. That's because with the E2 visa, you can apply directly at the U.S. Embassy or consulate in your home country. You don't have to submit in advance an application to USCIS, the U.S. Citizenship Immigration Services, which can create time delays and also just other impediments that USCIS has in their, in their vetting process. So these embassies, whether it's Paris or Madrid or London uh, or Toronto, for Canada, you have Toronto and Vancouver that handle E2 visas. So the Quebecers and the folks in Ontario typically go to Toronto. You submit the application at the embassy, and it can be anywhere from a few weeks to a few months, depending on the embassy and the consulate, how long they take to, to process the application and call the family or the applicant in for an interview, typically the applicant uh, and, and his, his or her spouse and, and the children that are, that are uh, over the age of 14. The, the advantage of the E2 visa, um, w which which is very important for many families, is that the spouse can get a work permit. It's very important because that, could be, that, that can be a deal breaker. That's been that way for years and it, about 10 years ago, our administration realized that, our, our, our Congress realized that and said we need to give work permits for the spouses. So that way, the investor can come and run his or her business here, which by the way can be in real estate. For example, real estate management, real estate investment and management, managing multiple properties, not passive real estate investment, but investing in a building, in a bunch of units, in some sort of commercial venture focusing around real estate, E2 visas are granted for those. If you're employing American workers, if you've made the investment to make that business work, so there's not a minimum or maximum amount, but you have to show the console or the, the, the console that handles E2 visas that you've made the proper investment to make this business work. And by the way, you can go in with partners from your country. So if we're talking about France, we can have several French partners come in and invest together to make a larger investment. They can also partner with Americans, as long as at least 50% of the business is owned by people from that country, France or Canada, where, where, wherever they're coming from. Just a clarification. So you could have multiple people from the same country. You don't have to own 50%. People from the same country have to own 50%? It, it can, it, right. If the, if, the, if the combined investment of French investors, in the case of a French uh, deal or a Canadian deal, Canadian investors, comes to 50% or more, so, such that the E2 enterprise in Florida or in the US is at least 50% owned and controlled by investors from that country or a company from that country. So it could be a French company that's, that you can prove is French owned, it can be a French or Canadian publicly listed company that invests here. So it can be a very large E2 investment. And by the way, you can bring over citizens of your country as managers, executives, or specialized workers to work in your US business. So if you're setting up some sort of large real estate operation here, and, you, and you're gonna be working with a lot of French or Canadian or wh whatever, whatever country you're, you're coming from, and you need to bring over specialists that can work very well with, with your customers, then you can bring over a highly skilled manager, executive, or specialist. They do not even have had to have worked for your company before. They don't have to be investors. So not only the investor comes over, but you can bring others over. Again, as, as Roger mentioned, it's a five-year visa. There's no limit on the renewals. So if you keep the business going for 20 years, you can have a 20-year visa. What's important to keep in mind is that the children when they reach the age of 21 are no longer considered part of the E2 visa and therefore you need to plan accordingly for the children or, or the investor does, very, very important consideration. Um, uh, and that's, yeah. that's in a nutshell. Yeah, I, I want to bring Roger back in here for a couple of questions that lean towards uh, legislative and, and, and where we kind of see the EB-5 heading. Mm -hmm. uh, they extended it, but also, um, is it true that investment criteria can include uh, infrastructure as well uh, as long as it includes that five hundred uh, so, thousand dollars so in the, in the, the ten jobs? The EB five program is uh, a temporary program for regional centers, 
and it's set to, it, it, it was set to expire September 30th, and Congress, through a continuing resolution, extended it to December 9th of this year, and we expect uh, that it will be continued uh, at least for a year, we're, we're very hopeful. Um, the, there has been um, a lot of suggestions to reform the program. There is a current uh, bill from Senator Grassley and Senator Leahy, who are uh, senior, one is the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee and the other is a ranking member. And they have proposed um, for more transparency in the program and uh, a, lot of, a lot of good changes that would come um, in the, in the form of more, more uh, careful regulation, transparency, avoiding of conflicts of interest, um, making the investment uh, more clear to the investors, um, but also the two most prominent talked about changes would increase the investment limit, uh, investment amount from 500 to 800,000 for targeted employment areas and rural areas, and go from 1 million to 1.2 million uh, for those uh, outside the, t the, temp the targeted employment areas. So um, the, the, the major discussion around, around EB-5 and the major objection most um, some congressmen have is that the money's not going to where they want it to go. It's not going to some of the rural areas and it's not going to, um, to create uh, and to the high unemployment areas. Most of it's going to the cities, which in, in my opinion is, is great because there's a trickle down effect and, and, and jobs are also created. So what Congress has, um, and what, what Senator Leahy and Grassley have proposed is what are called set offs. So there's a 2000 visa set off that would go to manufacturing and infrastructure. So out of the 10,000 visas that are allocated, 2000 would go to, to, to infrastructure and manufacturing. So, so you think some of this uh, is the idea is to invest in um, more rural areas as well? There's, there, you think there's going to be some incentives? Right now, there's right now there's no preclusion to invest in manufacturing or, or infrastructure. It's just this is where the market has taken us. The market has taken us. The most attractive projects, which are marketed all over the world, but particularly in China, are um, are usually um, commercial real estate projects in our urban cities, and those right. those have the most appeal. Which, which brings me, is a great transition. Uh, Ronnie, you had talked to me a little bit about, you think a really good example of a project, it happens to be here today, but it is yeah. Paramount. And, yeah. and some of the qualities that Paramount has, it's in the inner core in a really great location, and uh, it really qualifies as an exemplary pro uh, project. Can you talk a yeah. little bit about some of the qualities yeah. of that project? Well, let me talk about Paramount, let me talk about Miami. First of all, Miami is, I don't know if you know the audience, obviously, this is a real estate crowd, I presume, completely. EB-5 is about 90, 95% real estate oriented, let's understand. And it, we're, the money's going to developers who are developing real estate projects. Mixed use, um, there's, I'm involved with about six condo deals in Miami, some on the ocean. Believe it or not, Miami Beach qualifies for TEA. Palm Beach qualifies for TEA because when they take the census tracts and figure out high unemployment, believe it or not, if you go to downtown Miami, you're in a poverty area. Because look, look, at, look at the census tracts around the city of Miami, downtown Miami. It speaks for itself. You go, you, you know, you, you go to the areas nearby and uh, Overtown, et cetera, et cetera. And, you, and by the way, that's true. And the goal is hopefully when you build a $500 million project, you're going to employ a lot of workers and people that come from that area. So EB-5 is designed to generate jobs. Um, one of the big problems, and I'm going to get to South Florida in a second, is I think last year half the money went to Manhattan, or Manhattan area. And that's been a big problem. Hudson Yards, but the largest project ever done. Hudson Yards, Steve Ross, the owner of the Miami Dolphins, did a project in Hudson Yards. The total, by the time he's done that project, he's going to raise over a billion dollars of EB-5 capital. We've got we to change that. I know, well, I mean, yeah, but, well, he's down here, too, with the dolphins, so let's see. But, uh, but so what's happened is South Florida's become a very significant market for several reasons. Then I'll get into, I think, Paramount, who's displaying here, uh, as a matter of disclosure, they're my client, but that's okay, is a great example of an ideal EB-5 project. Miami's become a world-class city in, in China and other places. It recognizes a world-class city. We think we are, but they now recognize as such because of the, all, all the transportations and the, you know, the uh, culture. Miami was, I think, last year voted the sixth, number six luxury shopping city in the world. 
Uh, I can go on and on. But Miami's really, and the Chinese in particular, the Chinese influence here has increased dramatically. The FIU, uh, University of Miami, a lot of the students are coming here. They're buying condos or driving BMWs. Or, or they're, they're the type of people you want here. They, I think they're going. A lot of them are going to stay and work here. Their parents may be interested in investing here, coming here. So we're seeing a tremendous Asian influence in Miami across the board. Biggest issue we have in Miami, two big issues. Then I'm going to get into the positive. We don't have a direct flight to Asia, and that's been proposed several times. If you read some of the newspaper articles, we have uh, American and two Chinese airlines debating it. The city of Miami wants an Asian flight. It's a marketing issue. The second drawback of Miami, it's the only major city in the country without a Chinatown from a Chinese point of view. Hopefully that will change in the near future. But Miami has been very attractive. And I'll tell you, what, what in, one industry very attractive for EB-5 is condominium development. Why? Because when you look at a capital stack, everybody knew my capital stack means, well, how do you get your money? How much money do you need to complete a project? Unlike almost any other state in the country, you can use buyer deposits in a condominium project to build the project in construction. So what that means is now the, the amount of financing in an, a condominium project is actually less than a traditional project because you have buyer deposits partially funding the projects in the industry today. Normally, developers are getting 50% deposits, 10% stay in escrow. As per the statute, 40% are used for construction. So from EB-5 world standpoint, these projects have, one, less debt than a traditional project because you have senior debt, you have EB-5 debt, you have developer equity, you have buyer deposits. Buyer deposits are like equity. So that's attractive. The second is easy, easy exit strategy. You don't have to worry about how you're getting paid back. By definition, a condominium project has a self-generating you know, liquidation process that enables you to generate cash to pay back all the debt so that the EB-5 investors get paid back their debt. Now you get to projects like Paramount as an example, um, which one satisfy the urban environment. Actually, Paramount is located right on a right off of Biscayne Boulevard in an area that, in and of itself, one would not politically object to because it's really next to a, a, a higher unemployment area. Even though Biscayne Boulevard and everything around it is booming, right near it is a, a fairly high unemployment area. So you're really the whole downtown is being regentrified with a lot of capital, and a lot of these projects are EB-5 projects. Secondly, which is also interesting, besides being obviously a very desirable project and a you know, trend-setting project because of its design and its nature of the whole Miami World Center, is the fact that all, there's nothing preventing EB-5 investors from buying condominium units. So as we were talking to the panel before us, was, mar was talking about marketing projects to China from an investment standpoint or a, a purchasing standpoint, EB-5 goes right hand in hand with that because every EB-5 investor is a potential condo investor or a real estate investor. Every real estate investor from China or foreign countries is a potential EB-5 investor if they're aware of it. Oh, you're buying a unit. Are you interested in EB-5? Maybe you want to migrate here. And how do you do it? There's ways you could invest in the same project that you bought your unit in and actually you know, get double status. You, you, you invest, you get your green card, and at the same time you separately buy a unit and you kind of, you're, you're, in, you're married to the same project in two different vernaculars. So Paramount's a good example of that. I, uh, I, I want to get, get uh, back to Glenn real quick. Sure. Um, first of all, you're saying it's a number six shopping? Well, it was rated last year, number six. My wife shopping. thinks it's Luxury a number shopping. one shopping Luxury. Luxury. city. <laughs> but but I, I want to get a little bit to, to asset classes and what you're seeing, Glenn. Um, is there a sweet spot, is there an office, uh, hotels, uh, uh, condo Are units for EB5s? For EB5s. Three, two, three, two. Either one. You can. Why don't, why don't you difference. you address well, either one? We keep in mind that uh, there's there's two classes of EB5. Among, uh, we can say there's regional centers, which is which is what Ronnie and Roger have been talking about, which is the major large majority of projects, and that's the one that is potentially up for expiration again, although it's probably going to get renewed. And then there's individual EB-5s. So that's for a foreign investor that he or she, him or herself, will invest $500,000 typically in building a business or acquiring a business. So if they start a new business, they have to create 10 jobs. If they acquire an existing business, they have to demonstrate that through their investment, they're, they're boosting the company up. Typically, they're going to save some jobs and add some jobs to the amount of 10, 10 workers. 
That is very common in franchises. There's a lot of franchises that will work out inside and outside the regional center concept. Some, many more and more very large franchise groups are going outside of the regional center concept and, and offering EB-5s as sort of a, a model for the investor to come in and invest. The investor can also invest in his or her own concept or acquire his or her own concept. But that is common. It's not nearly as predominant as, as, in, as in regional centers. Types of regional center projects I've seen in addition to real estate are hospital development, school development, um, working around universities, research and development, uh, hotels. So it, it's, it's pretty diversified. Yeah, I, I just want to add one thing, though. That, that sure. But most of those deals have a real estate base. Yeah. And the investors like a real estate base. If you're running a hotel, it's a business, but it's a real estate base, even healthcare. It's a facility. Usually, they're, you're building a facility. And, and they're not necessarily that. investing in the real estate itself or the operations. They're invest. They're making. A, they're pulling their investor money and making a loan, for in a regional center context. And the EB-5 Direct, it's a permanent program. It's not subject to congressional extension now. It's permanent, and you'll see typically uh, individual investors who want to do it themselves. It's, it's the, really the defining difference between EB-5 Direct and regional center programs. Our EB-5 Direct are usually entrepreneurs that want to create their own businesses. So we'll get a people who they want to operate franchises, they want to open up their own restaurants. Um, whereas EB-5 regional centers are pooled structured investments that are, are made uh, with the purpose of getting the green card through indirect job creation. It's very distinct differences. Right. One of the practical considerations I want to mention, because as, as the real estate agents that are in direct contact with the clients, they're going to ask you, well, when can I come? When can I get here? When do I get my green card? And what needs to be understood that in, in all these cases, whether it's regional center, whether it's China, which is really long, or it's not China, there is a significant wait in the, in, in the, in the range of two years for the EB-5, who are hoping that gets, that gets improved because investors are willing to pay more to the U.S. government for it to be sped up. One of the issues is that the U.S. government needs to hire very highly skilled financial type of, of immigration employees to handle these cases, and they need to ramp up their operations because if they were to say, okay, we're going to increase the fee by $5,000 for the EB-5 program, every, I, I would venture to say that every single investor that's investing half a million dollars is going to pony up another 5000 and then immigration, and, and with that, there'll be some sort of premium processing guarantee that now they have to do it in six months, for example, or three months, or even a year, immigration will not, every, every application will come in with that requirement, and immigration won't be able to handle it. So until they can ramp up their operations and get the people to handle the cases, they're in this quagmire because they want to improve it, the Congress wants to improve it, the developers want to improve it, you got, we all want to improve it. So what happens is they're looking for other alternatives, and that's a big benefit to our schools here in South Florida, whether it's the University of Miami or FIU or NOVA, or, or American Heritage, or Ransom Everglades, Gulliver, et cetera, a lot of these families, and you probably see it, your, your clients are putting their children in school here. And a lot of times, it's, a it's sort of testing the temperature. If our children like it here, then maybe we're going to like it here too. So you, you probably see that that's a very common first step. Mm -hmm. Let's put our kids in school, see if they like it. Maybe we can come and accompany them under a visitor visa and see how they're doing, et cetera. Uh, if you're coming from Canada, Europe, uh, Latin American countries like Mexico, Colombia, uh, Argentina, Costa Rica, even Brazil that doesn't have, I'm talking about the E2 visa now, those are countries that have the E2 visa treaty. Not every country has that option. But if you're from Brazil and you're a dual citizen, for example, many Brazilians have or qualify for Italian citizenship. So a Brazilian that has an Italian passport or can make a claim for an Italian passport, as an example, can apply for this E2 visa at the U.S. consulate in Sao Paulo, or in Rio, or, in, or the embassy in Brasilia, and get a visa. That way you can get up here that much quicker. They, you may then make a $100,000 investment, $200,000 investment, and get up here, and then decide that you're going to invest further into that business, up to, say, $500,000, and, and get up to 10 employees in that business. You may then qualify for EB-5. So there, there's many alternatives, but one of, the, I think, the big issues that I see with my clients is we want to, We've decided we want to come, we want to do it now, help us. So you have to work around the EB-5 constraints and find other solutions for your clients because if they can't get here in a reasonable period of time, they might go somewhere else. I, 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 wanna, I wanna get one, uh, one more question then. 
there's been some issues. Some people have asked us um, at what point, since I have free legal advice from three attorneys up here, I'm going to take advantage of it. Free legal advice is free, over. For, okay. for, I got a couple <laughs> of minutes of free legal advice. Okay. Um, at what point are we talking about securitization? In other words, are, are any of these things that uh, brokers and agents can't participate okay, well, no, in? That's a good question. That's my space. Because this is my space. Let, this, me, let, okay, let me get into it. So um, the question is, do you want to comply with the law or not? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, there's two issues. One's, this is interesting. One's brokerage, real estate brokerage, and the other securities brokerage. I'll explain the difference. Uh, most of you or a lot of you in the room are probably licensed or either agents or brokers, real estate brokers, you're licensed. Getting brokerage commissions on selling real estate, no issue at all, perfectly fine. Believe it or not, if you work with a coordinate in other countries, I've checked with the uh, Department of Professional Regulation, talked to their general counsel, foreign agents don't have to be licensed in Florida to share brokerage commissions. In fact, if developers go to China and market their goods and pay commissions to people in China, that is a, that's also an exemption from the broker, but the, being over, because you're not doing business in Florida or the United States, that's one thing. Now let's do the reverse. Now you have a customer that comes to Miami or South Florida, wherever it is, and it buys a piece of real estate and says, I really like this EB-5 program. I want to invest in this program. And developer, what are you going to pay me for that? And it's like, oh, that's, you know, I mean, all right. So that's a commission. So securities regulations is very strict on this. The SEC regulates that. And basically, just like the brokerage industry, the real estate brokerage industry, you're not allowed to get paid a commission if you're not licensed. So that means technically that a real estate broker to get a commission would need to be affiliated with a licensed broker dealer in the United States. And you, you have to have a Series okay. 7 license, right? Well, there's min, min, many licenses, so that's not correct. It's multiple licenses. Because okay. if you're just selling EB-5, you can get an okay. 82, a 68, I think. There's a bunch of okay. licenses you can get. Seven being one of them. So you need to be, now what's, now let's go to the next step. Many agents have offshore offices, offshore, offshore affiliates. Now if you have, now if your marketing activities are done offshore and you have an offshore and it's being done through an offshore office, independent of the local, you get, a, you get, a, you get what's called a foreign exemption. Like in China, China being the largest market in the world by far, they have what's called migration agents. They're not licensed in the United States. They get commissions, they get huge commissions, huge commissions for marketing EB-5. And they're not, re they're not subject to US regulation because their activities are done offshore. So you can understand now the complicated divergence of being in South Florida and, this, and trying to navigate, was the sale done in Florida or was the sale done offshore and who did the selling? So we have advised multinational agencies, you know, brokerage agencies, that if they do their conduct offshore, and if the marketing is done offshore, and, they, and they, their office is offshore, and all the materials offshore, and everything's done offshore, then you should be able to be exempt from broker-dealer registration for the commission to be paid to an offshore agent. But you cannot have any marketing taking place in the United States. Okay, so that's a very good question, a very yeah. misunderstood issue. There's a, a finder exemption, which is very limited, where if you and it, it does work. Uh, there's a, if you as a broker say to a developer, look, I got the name of a buyer here. They may be interested in your EB-5 program. If they make an investment, pay me a finder's fee. On a limited basis, there's an exception for finder's fees, but it's very limited. We don't have the time to go into it, but yeah. there is an exception for that. But we, we were, I was very fortunate. I'm lucky. I know all the other panels were great, but mine was the best. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I had the three wise men up here, and they were really I amazing. I want to make one other comment. Can I, can real, I, real quick? Yeah, because it's important, too, because you, you know, you're all dealing with four, we, we're, we're talking about foreigners now if we're talking E2 and E5. E2, one of the advantages of E2, as uh, Glenn pointed out, is you, you don't have to be a taxpayer. Understand that, right? You don't have to be a taxpayer. There's no requirement you spend. If you're spending six months in the year in the United States, hmm. you're deemed to be a resident, you have to file a tax return, with rare exceptions. Sure. Now you've got an EB-5 applicant. The people coming over in an EB-5 are, are deemed automatically, if when you get your temporary green card, you are a U.S. taxpayer, because you have a temporary green card. That's a plus, or not. I mean, one could look yeah. at it and say, okay, I don't have to pay tax in my own country, I pay tax in the United States, but a lot of people don't like the U.S. tax, because in their countries they seem to have a lower tax rate, they may or may not, 
So what's very common in China is many of the times only one spouse immigrates with a child and the other spouse stays behind. China has a very favorable tax treaty that they can come here six months a year and not be deemed a resident. So just a little tidbit. Excellent. Let's, let's thank Ronnie, Roger, and Glenn, the three wise men.